Arsenal go down south, riding high from the North London Derby victory, and the question is, can they do it on a cold, wet Saturday night in the Amex? The answer is no. This is the Arsenal Vision post-match podcast. My name is Elliot Smith, the Blackman Twitter, Yankee Gunner. It was cold, it was wet, it was windy. Um, it didn't work out, let's put it that way, but it is a battling point. I guess we can discuss it as a disgusting, vile, hideous performance that leaves us tearing our hair, rending our flesh, furious with the manager, the players, and the club in general, or a battling point that shows that this club has something about it, that the players are there to fight for the manager, that the manager can get through the hard times, that we can eke out a point when everything is going against us. I am sure those of you listening fall into one of those two categories, but we will try to uh, bestride those two categories, to bring them together, to create a union, to analyze the match in a way that makes it much more enjoyable than watching it was. And I don't know about you, but ending a Saturday night wet and exhausted is supposed to be better than this, isn't it? Oh, God, they told me not to say that in the pre-match comments, and I said it anyway. Here with me now is Clive. You can find him on Twitter at Clive BFC. Hello, Clive. Hello, hello. And Paul, you can find him on Twitter at Positive My Pants. Hello, pause. Woohoo! You said you didn't have an open. I, I didn't have an open. <laughs> I just hit record. This is what came out. You know how it works. I mean, well, preparation be damned. This is about extemporaneous speaking, and that's how we do it. Um, yeah, we did a boozy instant reaction, if you want to hear that. I thought it was actually quite fun, maybe more fun than the match itself. And then we had a, a little after party when we stopped recording that will never be released, but <laughs> that, was kind of, that was kind of fun, too. Cl- Clive regaled us with his thoughts on many a topic. It did dawn on me. The next time Arsenal play football, I will be there, and I am so excited for that. And that means that we are now, gosh, just a couple of weeks away, not even a couple of weeks away from our event at the Victoria Tavern, Holloway Road. Obviously, the the tickets are sold out. Gunner Blog will be there, James McNicholas, uh, James Benj, Clive, Tim, and myself, uh, recording a podcast that that is a ticketed event, but we'll all be there after that. So starting at 4.30 p.m., 16.30 uh, local time, at the Victoria Tavern. It's open up to 300 people can come and just celebrate with us, drink with us, uh, have a good time with us. And because Arsenal will not have played that weekend, we'll all be in good spirits. There'll be nothing to bring us down, nothing to bring us up maybe. Although, you know, there's always a chance Tottenham will lose, which is something we can anticipate with excitement. So that's coming up. I hope you'll be there. Really looking forward to it. And with that, we can sort of uh, get started, unfortunately. Clive, look, one of the things that I think is difficult in a match like this is you're always going to look at the elements and look at the conditions in which the game were played. The game weren't played. The game was played (laughs) and, and feel that it it had an outsized impact on the performances. But I do think it's fair to say that Brighton aren't exactly a, a long ball lump it up to the big man team. They, they passed the ball around neatly and nicely. We did not. So while I am absolutely open to the elements being an excuse I do want to sort of avoid falling into that trap because the one thing I'll say, and then then I I will actually lead this to a question and turn it over to you. I don't want to be the fan base slash podcast slash group of people where it's, well, this player wasn't available, so the performance doesn't count. Well, the pitch was dry, so the performance doesn't count. Well, the pitch was wet, so the performance doesn't count. I, I want to try to analyze performances, not in a vacuum because that's not fair, but but based on an assessment of, of of what the players did right and wrong. And so for me, Clive, this game really boils down to sloppiness in key moments. They pressed, they did it well, we played out, and we couldn't control the ball. And and I think from Tomiyasu to Thomas Party to Odegaard to Aubameyang, you know, every time we tried to play out past the first five minutes, I mean, there was that one great sack of chance early, and we'll, we'll get on to some of that. But can you explain or touch on the ways in which those loose touches, and especially with Odegaard and Aubameyang when we tried to get it up the pitch and out of the press, really prevented us from, from I think, exposing what was a great deal of space to play into. Yeah, it's a, you know what, this game is actually one. I don't, uh, you said let's go for an hour. I reckon I can do that on my own. <laughs> this game, I, I mean, think. I have uh, no doubt. And if that is the case, I'm, I'm willing to hit mute, have a coffee, you know, a croissant, <laughs> sit back, listen to your wisdom. But well, you know, if you'll play us in, we'll, we'll, we'll play it back to you, I promise. <laughs> We've just got a. We just come through our block of four, uh, four games, and we got we got ten points. So all good, all all good in the world, right? So we can. So I'm in a reflective mood about this game, and I, I sort of compared it back to almost a Brentford game, actually. Another game where a team played three at the back, two forwards, and and, and wing backs. Chelsea did it, and um, Brighton did it, and we've not really had control in any of those games. So that tells me something about we need to find a way of overcoming that system. Now, a lot of the listeners will know what I would do. I would match up. 
Um, I tend to want to match up those systems because it's a positional system that covers the pitch. And it's about creating matchups that suit you. So if you're progressing the ball really, really well, what happens is Brighton don't leave their three at the back versus our three up front. They're forced to pull their wing backs back. But we couldn't because we couldn't retain it in those central areas through really a Bamiyang, Odegaard, and maybe a little bit of party. We couldn't retain it, so we couldn't create the secondary movement. So a classic example, and I tweeted this, I think I tweeted it or said it somewhere before we actually happened. I said this is an upset and through game. And if Smith Rose had scored, I'd all look like a genius, right? Upset, set back, first time ball, third man run through. And it was either do that or go back to front to three sprinters, narrow or wide, doesn't really matter. But you had to have a different dynamic in the forward line. So you have a setter or you have three sprinters and you hit areas and you push them back. And what you're really trying to do is make their back three into a back five. You're trying to mm-hmm. pin them. You're trying to create superiorities. And so we didn't quite do that because we couldn't retain it. So they kept pressing. They kept pressing. They kept getting joy. They kept creeping. And they territorially won the game. The fact that they're rubbish in the box and get booted into the seats made, you know, it's scary for us because it's nil-nil. But actually their big chance creation was really, really poor. And the conditions probably have something to do with that. It's hard to be accurate in these situations, not only in build-up, but also in finishing. And so for me now, the trend and the things we have to solve is the problems that this system creates us. And I don't think we've done well against it. And the only times we have done is when we've matched it. Yeah. And I think if we do that, we can fix it. Now, I can hear the other part of my brain saying, oh, we're also we shouldn't change our system to match another team system. We're a big club, blah, blah, blah. But we're a big club of young players. And I want to retain their I want to retain their momentum, I want to retain their where they are in their brains. I want to make sure that they can grow. And to do that, sometimes you might just have to match up. And, and we've got players to do it really simply. Really simply. I don't think it takes away from us. I don't think it's something we should be embarrassed about. We're trying to control the game man for man and let our talent win. Don't let uh, I thought we were we were out systemed on the day, but mm. we managed it really well. So if you go back to Brentford, I, I, co- I know on statistically, Brentford, I looked today, see if there's any comparison statistically, and it wasn't really because Brentford, we had the ball a lot. We, and we didn't really, <laughs> have, we didn't have the ball in this game. It was almost the flip side, wasn't it? Because they had 21 shots to our eight in this game. And against Brent, for Brentford, I feel like it was almost exactly the opposite. We yeah, took a I lot of it, shots, but low quality. Yeah, absolutely right, Elliot. I think, and, and so I'm looking at that game statistically, and I thought, God, we weren't that bad. But in this game, we were sort of, we were dominated a little bit more. So I, I do feel, there isn't much trend between the two games apart from the, f- the lack of control factor that I felt and the fear factor that I felt. But it's also a step forward because we dealt with that so much better than Brentford. And if we go for the team selection, I'm sure there's a number of different players and that's the reason why. So an enjoyable game from a tactical perspective, but I think it's time to really focus on learning from this. Because there are many other back three teams that want to push us into areas where we don't want to be. And what are we going to do to react to that? Yeah. And and I think, well, I'll, I'll tee you up for this then, Paul, because I think you wanted to touch on it. It was something that struck me as well over the weekend. Uh, listening to Klopp's comments after the, let's face it, quite excellent Liverpool City game. Um, City were dominant, absolutely dominant in the first half. And Klopp talked about how you know, they, they were getting pressed back and he talked, I, I won't give the whole quote, but it was basically about, you know, the, the spaces that City closed down that Liverpool didn't react too well. And then as City became more dominant, Liverpool got what he called a bad feeling and stopped playing football and started playing long balls that weren't really helpful, um, you know, and had the ball coming right back at them when he thought that there were chances to play around the the press. And he made some adjustments in the second half and you see the outcome. I do think that it wasn't exactly the same in this game, but there was that... Weird thing where Ramsdale was going long a lot, where we started trying to play around them and the ball wasn't sticking for Odegaard, for Aubameyang, for Party, And then we just started lumping the ball a little bit. And you've just got to play around that press. I feel like we talked about this after the Brentford game too. You know, the idea that when a team comes on to you, that should suit what we want to do. Quick transitions back to front. And in fact, if you look at how we dismantled Spurs, back to front. Right? They came on to us. I mean, the, where they almost nipped it off Ramsdale, giving it to Shaka, that turns into a goal. We just didn't have the execution in this game. And to be fair, against Burnley and Norwich, we talked about it as well that execution let us down from scoring more goals. In this situation, it was more that execution let us down from just getting it out 
cleanly. But I, I wanted to sort of give you a chance to to raise that that Klopp quote as well, and whether you think that we sort of lost our willingness to try to play around that press. Because the one thing I'm sort of realizing, I think, about football when it comes to talent level, a good organized press lets you use your athleticism to compensate for maybe a lack of technical quality against your opposition. And both Brent, Brentford obviously do that very well. Brighton did that very well in this game, even without Basuma. And I just, I just think we kind of gave up a little bit of our opportunity to use that to our advantage. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I heard the same Klopp quote and thought, oh, interesting echoes for us. Yeah. Um, especially, you know, you add that to him standing on the sideline shouting at them to be brave in the first half. The um, thing is, we started reasonably brightly. I, I kind of mapped it out, the arc of the game, and like the first maybe 12 minutes, we're okay, we're in this. They've got a bit more ball, but uh, we have interesting situations and attacks we build. Uh, one of the themes of the game for me, actually, especially when you add in the second half, is we have lots of situations, but we're actually pretty poor in the penalty area, which I find probably the most concerning part of this whole game, actually, is that I felt we were toothless when we got into our be- best situations, um, more so than the the kind of the power balance in the game what we did when we got in the in and around the final third and penalty area, uh, I found pretty frustrating because actually, if you map it out, we're pretty good for good chunks of the second half. I'm not saying better than them, but we're well in this and we have our situations. We end the second half strong. We start the second half strong. We end the first half strong. We start the first half strong. But they have this 25 minutes or so in the first half which I think defines this game in people's minds, and rightly so, where Brighton have the upper hand. Now, one of the things he said was, they're not a long ball team, but they kind of are in this game. Mm. Because 100% of their kickouts are launched to Dan Burns. And what I think they did really well, that we did, like most of ours are launched too, I think it's 86%. So five and six, Ramsdale goes long. I don't actually remember him going short, uh, must have happened when the camera was somewhere else. And what they do well is they hit Dan Burns, whereas we don't hit anybody. We're hitting Obama Yang or somebody else. Maybe this was a game to play Pepe on the wing, if that's what we were planning to do. Because mm. you know they're going to press. The difference between them and Spurs is these guys are really good at pressing. They are the pressingest team in the league, along with maybe Southampton, yeah. uh, in pressures in the final third. They were really well set up. We didn't or couldn't play around them so we went long and they loved that because when we went long they got the ball when they went long they got the ball because they invested they doubled down on dan burns put a bunch of people around him in good positions whereas we left obama young on his own with maybe smith Rowe in the general vicinity guess who was getting the ball so i agree with clive on the system thing we were out systemed mm. um Interesting with the Klopp thing, though, we were better in the second half. Now, that's probably partly because um, Brighton couldn't sustain that level of energy and pressure and therefore couldn't press to the same extent. But also, we made our adjustments, and part of those adjustments was getting uh, uh, Smith Rowe and Saka to get it, drop back a little bit, Odegaard a little. Like, if you look at touches for those guys, they're... They have far more t- touches close to our defensive third in the second half than the first half where they've dropped in, picked up the ball, and helped us play out. Mm. And in the first half, I just don't think we got players in the right area of the pitch when the ball was going to drop. We didn't win second balls. We Yes, we were sloppy, but sometimes you're sloppy because you, you, you're getting used to not having good options around you, not expecting to have two or three outlets uh, every time the ball fell to a uh, Dan Burns or something like that from their long balls, he had three, four guys in the area. They'd they'd crowd that area for the ball to come down. Maybe we didn't quite have that aerial option, but I really felt that the difference was how they deployed their resources in the first half. They got good players in good spots around their moments of possession, and they had far more possession. The other thing they did well, I thought, in the first half was they worked their triangles on both sides of the box. And we kind of didn't. Like, you can think of the Tierney going up the wing, banging in a cross. It's kind of like, why? 
Yeah, yeah. They got three lugs defensively, and we got Obama Yang and maybe Smith Rowe in the area. And the other side, you know, Odegaard had a quiet game, but it's not. A, if you think of Odegaard and Sack over on that corner without an overlapping fullback, win back, that wasn't very promising either. And we just, we had situations, but their system was better than our system. Second half, you could you could argue that, and I think that would make, you know, I'm looking forward to having another good look at the second half because yeah. it had promising stuff, but yeah. not no real threat was the problem outside of a couple of well, moments. You know, the, the thing I would just say is that the funny thing about this game, I think that there are things we can praise in terms of the defensive side of it, and I want to do that. I want I want to make sure that we cover the things that did not work in this game and that are frustrating. And also the things that worked that allowed us to get a battling point, as opposed to what happened against Brentford in a game where we had some similar challenges with different personnel and got beat 2-0. Um, I certainly think we will have to talk Odegaard a bit. I mean, he made 16 passes in this game at 76%. He played no passes into the penalty area. Um, it just it was kind of anonymous, wasn't he? Yeah, the yeah. Ball's going over his head, right? Wasn't it? Let's yeah, be honest. Yeah. The ball's going over his head, or it's a pressing game. So, I, okay, when I want people to understand, when I say system, I want you to understand what I mean by that. It's like we we've got Cucurella coming up against um, Tommy Asu. That to me is a matchup we don't want. We want Cucurella fighting with Saka or a wing back. So I mean, if he's that close to our goal, we're in trouble. That means they're overloading. If he's man of the match, which he was, yeah. we're in trouble. Right, so by having wing backs or making sure we have chalk on boots in wide areas, you're forcing those wide centre backs in Duffy and Byrne to make a decision. They want to stay narrow. The only way they can stay narrow is by pressuring the ball up front really, really hard, forcing us to go long. Then they can stay narrow. They can win it and send it back. So unless we stretch them into wide areas and absolutely match them positionally on the pitch, we're not going to cause them to make decisions and change what they're doing. And so I said in the instant reaction pod, I said, Stock down was for the analysts, but really it's for everybody. It's the coaches and the management. Because Paul said that he's the most pressy team. I didn't know Brighton were the most pressy team, so no, I didn't know that. Mm. But Paul knows it. Our, our analysts and coaches should know it. And we should have an exit plan. And it's either it's either Lacazette or it's either wing backs or wingers on the touchline to go into wide areas slightly lower down and then really turn around and attack them. Do you know what I mean? And we didn't have that. And so it comes back to Things are in my head about Arsenal. And by the way, I love where we're going. I love the direction that we're going. But as we go in this direction, we have to develop the ability to adjust in game. And it's something that's been in my head. That you got me thinking now, boys. You're going to get it. I was drunk in the instant reaction. But we sometimes say things like developing game. What can we do? I tell you, do better in games. And some coaches are good. They can do it with one change, like... Tuchel did with Kante at Spurs. But, you know, football as a whole, whole, I sometimes think we expect a lot from our management to change within the game and to get it right every single time. And I often feel, and this is a general point, not an Arteta point, that the way football's set up with just three substitutes, I think we as fans expect the whole game to change. Well, you've got to keep people behind for injuries and things like that. Sometimes you make one change, but we expect everything to change. We expect everything to adjust. I think this is something, as a fan, as we expect and, and we're looking, you look at other sports like rugby, you look at obviously basketball, everything you can make changes all the time. You can make like seven, eight subs in rugby. It's something to think about. Our expectation versus change on the pitch. I'm not saying that this is a thing. I think this is a weakness of Arsenal at the moment. Or I think this is a development opportunity, shall we say. It's a weakness previously. He's done really well in the last four games, apart from maybe this one a little bit. But I think it's something we need to get better at because I haven't seen us come back from one nil down as too, too often, which tells me our ability to adjust isn't quite there. I, I think when we're trailing at halftime, we've never come back to win a game under Arteta. Yeah, so there you go. So the ability to adjust is quite. I think we're. I think we're valid to question that. Would that be fair to question that ability to adjust and recover and come back? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it's something we've yet to do. And I think there are reasons for it in my mind. And I think we need to focus on that as analysts and coaches and managers. For those on the Discord, I think I'm protecting people. Um, I'm not. I'm just saying you have a game model. You prep for a game. And the analysts and the coaches are all involved in that. 
And then you apply that game model to your players and your, to your actors. And I felt today against Brighton, we did our best to get out there with a point. There's no drama, but it's a great point. But looking forward, I think it's a development opportunity how we adjust to certain scenarios. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's fair. And like, it is. That's why I like to look at things long, longitudinally at times and say, are there trends that I see developing? Because <clears throat> over time, you will start to say, all right, for me, this is clearly an area where there's an, a need to adjust. And you'll also see strengths. The funny thing is, whether it's the Burnley game or the Norwich game or the Brighton game, they're all different. And they all had sort of different ways in which we executed and didn't execute. Two of those are wins, one isn't. But they're all similar in the sense that I think, at least at a neutral game state, our ability to sustain pressure and create clear opportunities is not as good as I'd like to see it. <clears throat> and I think you know, when we take leads, then you saw us start to create openings against Burnley that we didn't execute. We created a bunch against Norwich that we didn't finish. We did it against Spurs as well. In a neutral game state, I still think that we, we struggle to create those superiorities in the attacking part of the pitch. I mean, the interesting thing about this game is when we had a little bit of sustained pressure in the opposition final third, and we didn't do it much, I think they looked very vulnerable. But that is not a strength of this team right now. And the funny thing is, I'm really frustrated with Thomas Party in this game in particular because there were a couple of moments where we had some of that superiority and he just blasted shots into the stands. I mean, he took one really good shot that I thought was the moment. I thought that was going to be his goal from outside of the box. He passed it just around the uh, the right post. But yeah. he he took some shots. He had a free kick, obviously, that was just ridiculous. Um, he had another shot from long range that was that was not helpful. So I guess, well, well Paul, look, I'm, I want to bring this up. I don't want to make this the central part of the podcast because... Talking about a player that wasn't there isn't as helpful as talking about the players that were. And I do, by the way, I think we have to praise Gabriel and White. In a game where we created very little and it was very frustrating, it's easy to go to the things that didn't work. I do think those players are the reason we got a point, and I want to make sure we emphasize that. But obviously, there are going to be people listening who feel, is this... I hate to... I, you know what? I'm not, I'm not going to frame it that way. To what extent is Shaka's presence missed here? I would look at the Brentford game where we lost 2-0 and he started and I thought he had a bit of a rough game dealing with their pressure and I'm not saying it was terrible by any means and, and it was not a great lineup outside of him but I don't know that these are the games where Shaka fixes a problem. Samby was having to drop into that left half space to cover the space behind Tierney which I thought disconnected him from party and we didn't have the wall pass. You need that wall pass to play out, right? You give it to a guy, one touch to the guy near you and away you go. We saw when Lacazette came in how he had that wall pass a little more and we played him behind them a bit. We didn't have it with Odegaard, we didn't have it with Aubameyang and party didn't have Samby as close to him because of where he was playing. So I think structurally there were issues there. Do you get a sense that Shaka Shaka's presence would have in this game under these conditions help provide more of that because I it's not that I don't see it it's that I'm not sure that he would have been playing much differently than what Sambi was forced to do either well I think um, Sambi definitely played the Chaka role in the Chaka way mm -hmm. um, but he's not a left footer and that's a good point yeah. yeah and say what you like about Chaka he can hit a pass up the pitch now Am I convinced it would have changed that much? Like, what I really would have liked to have seen was Sambi and Party playing close together in this game. Uh, but we did that thing was where Sambi was pushed out to the left to cover. Um, they had basically five across the middle with two wing backs, so they were particularly concerned, as they should have been, about get it, us getting in behind Tierney any time he pushed forward or going into that corner. So I understand why we had him there. Uh, and it kind of made sense in the first half when they dominated possession because they were winning everything. They were winning our uh, long balls. They were winning their long balls. But as we changed in the second half, I wanted to see Sambi and Party getting closer and closer together so that they could play. Like, they're both really good on the ball. And that's how we should have hurt them in many ways to play out. There are other ways to play out than the Chaco way. So... We have options with Sambi and some, you know, I, I don't love the quirky system where uh, a midfielder goes off to play near or around left back. It solves one problem, but I, I, I'd love to have it explained to me. It seems like a bad trade-off because we should be able to play 
like Party and Sambi are both really good on the ball, even if they mm-hmm. had a bad game against these guys. Uh, Party in particular comes to mind as a guy who missed many moments to play out or a rough touch or whatever. But like, give him an easy pass to get him going. It's, it's like the Klopp quote, like once you start playing up the pitch, once you start having possession, once you start feeling it, you play the football. And when the the momentum, if you want to use that, is against you, you stop playing the football. Look, I think conditions are a significant factor in this. Not an excuse, but they're definitely a factor. And on a day like this, you either go really long or you get your players close together so they can play out. And I just don't think, especially in the first half, we got uh, our good ball-playing players close to close enough together. I think there was a missed opportunity Sambi and Party should have been played closer together uh, in the first half so that we could play through their pressure, through their press, get them close to, you know, get all the ball players close together more often, including White, who needed more support, more angles, um, so we can play out and hurt them because we only played out a couple of times. We didn't really try it. And yeah. Like, we made our adjustments in the second half. They had a little less energy. I'm not sure, was it us, our adjustments or their loss of energy? It sounded like uh, uh, Clive's chomping at the bit there. Yeah, Clive, because I'll hit you with some some Ramsdale statistics too that I think play into this into this part of it too. Yeah, I, I agree, Paul. I, I don't think it was a day to vacate. You don't vacate the left-back role when we're not in control. When yeah. we're in control, we overload five channels. Let's go. Yeah, we can do what we like because, like, for example, every day won't be a sunny Spurs day with one man midfield and and Deli Ali pick his nose on 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 the left centre back, right? And and then Don Bele wondering if his shorts fit him, which they didn't because his ass is too big and he can't run, right? So basically, that's the that's the situation we have in that game, and this is a different game because Brighton absolutely crushed the middle. They wanted to make sure we couldn't exit. People are watching our build up. They're watching party turn around and spin balls, disguise passes. They're watching Odegaard drop in. They're thinking, yeah, we're not having that. You're not doing that to us. You know, and um and so this is why I think we need a plan for this game. But it's very difficult to come up with a different plan, a different set of players after the sunniest day in our season for many a year, the week before. You know, we if we could have named the same eleven, we would have done. But again, it's how you play. And I think if Shaka plays back to your previous point I think we have a better relationship on that left hand side I think it's more leadership I think it's more you stay there we need to hold as a narrow four let's go you know four two a proper four two and create a square ahead and go from there now does that come from the sideline does that come from the pitch I don't know it's a debate I, I don't know but if, if we do that and we get so we get a square and we get an exit from the middle of the pitch you know, just a simple set with the defenders, and then next line, then you can create different pictures, and then you can then you can get your exits. And I think when Smith Rowe and Saka became a little bit more narrow, then I think we got through them a little bit more. I think, you know, to Paul's point, I agree 100%. Their energy went down, and we went from there. And we had another set when Lacazette come on, and it was all off to the races from that moment on. And then you saw their weaknesses in wide areas which we couldn't exploit due to their high energy and effort, which they put into the first two thirds of the game. So yeah, it's, it felt disappointing that we didn't quite see it, but I'm also really encouraged how we dealt with the fact we weren't in control. And so you can be unpleased, but also a little disappointed we didn't quite nick it. Yeah. And, and I think this isn't me picking on him because I don't know if it's the plan or not, but goal kicks, and goalie possession, keeper possession, is a period of the game where you, you you have a choice about how you want to try to break down the opposition. And, you know, I think we want to be a team that plays out from the back. That doesn't mean you do it all the time. I think when you're playing a pressing team, it's, you know, it's crisis or opportunity, right? They're the same symbol. It It is a chance to make a huge mistake. It is a chance to score a goal. That goal against Spurs that we talked about where Shaka fouls slash wins the ball well to to set us off and and you know leads to a goal that's using pressure against you know the opposition's pressure against them so just to hit you with some Ramsdale numbers in this game he played 6 of 7 passes short 6 of 7 he completed 6 of 7 he went long 20 times and completed two 
That's 18 possessions lost to long kicks where the ball is coming right back at you. Now, I don't know how many possessions there are in the game. could probably look that up, but I haven't. 18 possessions given back to Brighton is a lot of extra possession coming right back at you where presumably they're already set up in your final third ready to go. His goal kicks, he completed 5 of 15 goal kicks. They used goal kicks to set their press, and we gave them the ball back two-thirds of the time. And I just, I think that that right there is a systemic failure because it immediately creates a tone, a, a, a situation in the game where you've gotten the ball back and immediately it's coming back at you. When the forwards who have gone long, you've pushed them all up the pitch, they now have to sprint back in this wet pitch to get back, to get back into position. And you, you just, you're not giving your, your quality players, your better quality players, presumably, and I think it's fair to say Arsenal have better quality players, the chance to go play out and win. Win so why, the do you, why, do you, why do you think that was, Aiden? Why do you think that happened on this day? I, I, I absolutely have no idea. Would you? I mean, I could speculate. I could speculate. I mean, you know, I, I, I think that it can be fearfulness of the weather. What if we give it away? Sloppy pass. You know, we weren't controlling it well. I mean, it could be the way that they were pressing. We didn't feel that the opportunities were there. Maybe it was a lack of Shaka, you know, knowing where to come back and be available. Although I, I don't think he's always been the best recipient of the ball coming back. I don't know. I mean, I'm curious what you what you would say. I, I, do, I just felt, I just felt they locked on to us, man to man. Yeah. They locked on and risked it, and we couldn't make their risk cost them anything because we couldn't hold it. When Aubameyang just had an off day, he done so well back to goal in recent games. He smashed my recent theories that he's improving. The moment mm. I saw the headband, I thought trouble. Right, so um, <laughs> <laughs> I thought nah. you, 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 can't have, you can't have that hairline exposed in the wet in the wet weather, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Once he had the LeBron headband on, I thought, no, this isn't good. This is not good. <laughs> this is not good. He doesn't fancy this. Hey, look, horses for courses, right? Aubameyang had to play this game. But in hindsight, we're all looking at Lacazette and thinking, mate, this is a game for you. This is a game for you. you. You don't mind kicks. You don't mind pushes. You can buy fouls. You're not worried about those big lumps. You want to take them on. Hindsight team never loses. My hindsight team would have not lost this game, right? But mm. before the well, game... it's not helped by the fact that Lacazette was great for the 20 minutes he was on, but it was also their tiredest 20 minutes. So it's a bit of both, but... Almost everything he did when he came on kind of worked, and he made connections with Smith Rowe. There was the wall pass uh, back to it was a party who pinged it forward to Smith Rowe in the it's box. our best move of the game, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. And in the box, we suddenly started in their box. We st- suddenly started making some combinations and having some threat we hadn't before. But also, Brighton tired legs, heavy day with with the rain and the conditions, so. It's, it's probably a flattering view of him, but you, you yeah. kind of think, gosh, I wish I'd have that for 90 minutes. Yeah, absolutely. I <laughs> totally agree. But like I think I say, your exact quote, by the way, Clive, on the Instant Reaction pod was, when he came on the pitch, I could see his cheekbones. It was a totally different look. Like, <laughs> it was. <laughs> the, like Pitt, I think you said. Cheekbones yeah. looking like Brad Pitt. Yeah, oh, did, did you notice he looked how fit he looked and how sharp he looked? I mean, crikey, he's come to play, and he came back to the point we made that – the, you know, the future of our season is in the five or six that are not playing right now. Mm. And our first 11 mindsets need to change. And Lacazette reminded us, hold on a minute, I've got a role to play here. You know, and um, and there'll be others that come in, hopefully, and remind us they're not dead footballers. You well, know, so. well, okay, so so let's c- cover a few of the performances that maybe were a little worrying. We will get to Gabriel and White, and I think they, they deserve their praise. I, I We mentioned Ramsdale, so I'll just say, I don't think it was the cleanest game for him, and I don't think the distribution was good. He saves us the point with that late swat away from Mope. Mope sticking that in the back of the net at the end would have been a really bitter pill to swallow. And I do think that one of the challenges with analyzing football is results are so important. It's impossible not to be influenced by it. I think it is probably fair to say that if Ramsdale doesn't get to that ball and Mope sticks it in the back of the net, people are saying, a dreadful performance, unbelievable, as bad as any of the first three games. And because he does, we're saying it's a battling point and it was a good defensive effort. And I just, I'd like to try to be a little more circumspect about analyzing a performance than letting one little moment like that determine the lens through which you you see the whole game. I, I, I do think, Clive, that there's an Odegaard d- discussion to be had he looked so dominant against Spurs, and, and that was great. Um, but you pointed out rightly, both in the rewatch and, and off mic, that there had been a little sloppiness between him and Saka on that right half space and that it was something that they could tighten up. And that really 
ex- exposed itself again in this game. And I'm wondering if you if you think that Odegaard's still sort of figuring out his role there on that that sort of dropping deeper. It's it's weird, right? It's not a pure number 10 role that he's playing. And I thought when he came off and Smith Rowe moved in that role, he looked a lot more comfortable. So do you, do you have any thoughts on just sort of the growing pains Odegaard's going through in that role? Because we, we praised him to the high heavens in the Derby and I thought he deserved it. And then on rewatch, saw a little sloppiness that I didn't pick up on the first time. And that was definitely on display uh, at, at Brighton. Yeah, I thought in the Derby, he, he spent, if he had the five lanes in our, in our minds, I felt he was in four and five on the right hand side a bit more and I thought him and Saka swapped over a bit more and I'm thinking if you again if you're an analyst looking at Arsenal you want to snap the link between Party and Odegaard and our forwards you want to mm-hmm. snap that can I get around that if I get around that I stop Arsenal building up Arsenal can build up in nice ways and when they're off and running we're all in we're in trouble mm-hmm. right they, they're a transition team we're in trouble so can I snap that link and says, so who would you, you choose Odegaard? Well, you go for him. You'd snap the link to him and Saka. I thought Spurs tried it and, and did, did it for a while until they were stupid, right? And they didn't do it too long enough. And, and we were inaccurate in that side. And Tommy Asu got a big size on a couple of occasions and they weren't good enough to, to make us pay. I thought Brighton locked on to him. And so again, the next phase for Arsenal will be, a, a more of a post-up centre forward that can run in behind do both things. The the hybrid Lacazette, Aubameyang player that we all know we need, that we're going to have to spend money on. And I do think the next phase for us is having a lot more rotation with those three in behind and create problems, not just stand in their zones and be far happier if Odegaard wants to go wide, Les Mifro comes in and just create different pictures for the opposition. And don't be pinned to your lane. Be rotate around, flip inside and out, interior, exterior, and create problems for teams. This what this is what happens when you play well. When you play well in front of the nation and have a great day, people look at you. You know, people are looking at Manchester United. They're looking at Chelsea. Chelsea got stopped a couple of occasions. Lukaku's not been allowed to turn to his left foot anymore. He's not allowed to turn like he did against Mary, knock it off, run into the box. Thank you very much, side foot. That's not happening anymore because people Pablo are knocking him. looking over his shoulder for the car. <laughs> <laughs> it's not happening. People are looking at him and saying, yeah, we're going to make you go to your right foot. We don't let you turn to your left foot. We know that's danger. Aston Villa found out to that cost. People scout each other. They, they really do. And I think this is something we have to accept. We have to accept, okay, we got rumbled on this day. But while we got rumbled, we didn't lose 2 nil. I did at Brentford. Mm. And then this is it. We didn't. We we got out of there. Got on the coach, and and that, and thank you very much. This, can I have steak and chips, please, Mister Chef? And and sit down, and, and off and off we go. Right. So that's generally what happens. And I think uh, I think looking forward next couple of weeks, we'll probably talk about football a lot in the next couple of weeks, Elliot. I think there are games like this that stick in our mind, and how we. I still don't think we've fully solved this yet mate if i'm honest with you no and and it's why like ultimately i i think you you can feel good about the way you defend the point at brighton on a day when you just don't have your a game i still you know i think we created about a third of an expected goal eight shots and it it feels just a little too much like these kinds of days where there's credit to be given for some of the work that was done to protect the point uh, there should be just a bit more quality to be able to turn one into three. And the fact that we didn't really fashion enough chances to do that is upsetting. Now, look, Saka had one early. Smithrow had one late. He had the chance to square to... Actually, was it Pepe he could have squared it to? Or was it Saka? And it, I don't know that the pass on. He winds up taking it himself at the near post. Um, oh, it was uh, Saka, I think. Is it Saka at the far Yeah. Point? I can't remember but Duffy, Duffy did a great thing. You, you get taught this actually as a defender. You have these two-on-one drills. And as a defender, you got you got to block off the pass and only show him the near post, and the goalkeeper covers the near post. A classic two-on-one defensive drill where you've got people, two to attackers running at you. Can you block off the angle to the pass and then show him one side of the goal? And Duffy done it perfectly, and it's frustrating for us, but that's all that Smith Rowe could do on, on that occasion. Yeah, and I think one of the problems that I, I think we've just seen repeatedly with this system, and it's not a back three technically, but because of the way it builds kind of like a back three, Paul, it still feels to me like the problem is that the exits are wide when we get pressed. Again, Spurs, when it worked, the exits were more central, right? We got it to Smith Rowe, and look at that pass. He plays that diagonal to Saka to create, I guess it's the third goal. 
um, you know, the little one, two where the exit is central to Oba and Oba plays it back to, to Smith Rowe and away they go. But these exits were wide. And when we went to Tomiyasu, he tried to go to Saka. The ball was pressed. We gave it back. When we tried to go to Tierney, he had an off game. We gave it back. Um, and I think that this is what teams want us to do. And I think our system sort of plays into it a bit much. I mean, do you think that that's over nitpicking, Paul? Because I do think that when we try to exit out to the wing, I mean, if I'm a pressing team, that's what I want. Tomiyasu pinned up against the touchline. Tierney up against the touchline, you know, trying to find someone to give it to. And I don't want Party and Sambi playing wall passes to each other, giving it to Odegaard in the center of the pitch. The fact that Odegaard you know, completed 16 passes in the whole game, you know, I think it tells you that we ne- we didn't really have that that path out from their pressure. So do you think we have to find ways to create that centrality when we're pressed like this? Because this game went back to being one where we had very little centrality, a lot of attempts to go out wide, a lot of attempts to go long up to the wings. And and I still think that that system is a lot easier to shut down. Now, it's easier said than done. I get it when they're pressing you to try to ping passes one, two, three, right through the middle of the pitch. And if you lose it there, you're dead. And I think that one of the reasons Arteta has built the system this way is we rarely lose the ball in the middle of the pitch, which means we're rarely running back at our goal exposed. And that's how we wind up getting points in games like this. But the, the trade-off is easy to see. We just don't play out enough. Uh, yeah. No, uh, obviously centrality is what you're looking for. But you got to earn the right. you got to be good enough. And we're, we're not there yet. Um there's not. You, I'll ask you point blank. Sorry, I'm because I, I want to get onto it, and, and we're forty minutes in. in. In answering this, can you also maybe talk about Party's role in this game? He looked so leggy to me generally, and it was just a very weird game from him. And I thought that that impacted it as well. Uh, it did. I don't have a great answer for what the issue for Party was. Like some of it was sloppiness from him, and there's no ifs, ands, and but. But some of it was we leave him a lot to do. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, in the second half, Smith Rowe got back. Saka got back. Uh, Odegaard even dropped in a little bit more. There were more touches. He had Lacazette dropping for a wall pass. But also, uh, Brighton weren't all that with the press in the second half. In the first half, as as Clive alluded to, they'd be nuts not to have screamed, screamed Thomas Partey. And they did. I mean... We shouldn't, other teams do tactics too, especially in the first half with Brighton. Like that was when their their plan was clear to see and it was working. And like other teams have players too. L- Lalana is a really good fucking player. Is he? He's, yeah, when he's oh. fit. Oh. Uh, all right, no, that's fine. Look, oh, I mean, man, I, yeah. I've, I've he's never such cared a for cla- him. It's fine. He's it's so fine. quick with mm. his thinking and his passing. Like he doesn't, he doesn't do that much, which is why he's good. Like, if you look at the clever <laughs> triangles, it's a quick pass from Lalana that puts, you know, Cucurella in behind our back line. I mean, he's just in the right. He's he's silk when he's good, when he's fit and he's at it. Well, actually, when he's fit, he's generally at it. Um, Come back and, to the microphone a bit. You're getting a little out yeah, of Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Uh, I think Trossard as well. He's not absolutely brilliant, but he's very quick. And those two guys on, on either side were good on their triangles. So we, we had headaches to lay calm down a bit and you know party had more than he can handle but he like we've seen on quite a no- few games now where he y- you look at it and you say well that's not the same party now uh, i think it's partly on him but it's very much like you can just see a di- it's a different game first half and second half not that we're great in the second half but at least we're playing at least we're it's a bit more like the spurs game where uh, it made perfect sense to put Smith Rowe into the Odegaard spot in the second half and, and get Pepe on. And we're getting up and down the pitch and we had that verticality. We also had more centrality in the second half because we were getting yeah. at them a bit more. But I do think it's not as simple as saying, oh, look, zone 14, why don't we play at that more? Because the other team, the first thing you're the defense does is say let's secure the center of the pitch and sure. only give them the wings and that's you know that's the battle if you look at um liverpool's think- goals as i remember them yesterday i mean to get at city they had to go down the wings they're just so good going down the wings they worked it into the center yeah but clive i was just gonna say paul touched on something there 
I'm, I'm just thinking of solutions. I'm in solution mode, really. What happens, happened, right? And we got away with it, so there's no drama, right? So, but I think we, how did we solve it? I think we had a player that posted, and I think we did it with offensive distances by just being closer together. And I think that probably worked on this occasion. I'm not 100%. Maybe Elliot, we did a second half free watch maybe this week. Yeah, I think that, may be, that may be a bit more informative, but. I, again, I'm just looking at solutions. Do we do we go back to front quicker with, with a Pepe who can obviously win it more physically? And because um, I think I actually think he was missed in this game, and, and might have won a few of head or, headers for us as well if we got some people around him. Absolutely, yeah. And we had a choice. We had a choice how to replace Shaka, and I think there is a Shaka effect here because Shaka's got the balls and the personality to, to come and get it. So is Sambi, but he's he's an up and coming player, and people want to get him because he's young and want to push him about. They're really they're going to try to screen party and Odegaard. But with the Shaka effect, if Shaka's there, he's got enough personality to be mobile, to go and get it off people. And he just, he's just an experienced international captain, for God's sake, right? So he knows about these days. But in, in hindsight, again, the hindsight team is different. Do you, rather than have Odegaard watching a game of tennis over his head, you have him deeper on the ball and progressing the ball, and his passing ability is better. And so maybe for this day, I know you might think, actually, we needed Sambi, we needed that player in there, slightly more defensive. I actually think controlling the ball at the base of the team is really key to Arsenal Football Club because we like to build. We need, we need the three lanes, the three layers. One, two, to get... It can't just be one because it just comes back. We're not physical enough up front. We need that extra lane. So by pulling Odegaard to be the Shaka replacement on this day might have worked because he's just too good once he has touches. But once he was looking at the game backwards and going over his head, he just bypassed him. So we lost mm. him to the to the game state and how it was going. So I do think, and it's not something I ever thought I would say, but the best replacement for Shaka might actually be Odegaard. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I don't hate that. Him. Yeah, I don't. I don't hate that at all. And, and look, I think there are people that were frustrated with with Sambi's performance in this game. I, I I don't think it was great. I don't think it was bad. I think it was sort of like he had a job to do, and I think the job that he had to do in guarding the space behind Tierney took him away from the job he does better. I don't see him as a deepest midfielder. That I don't. You know, Shaka. I think can be. I think Shaka. The, the one thing that you've always said, Clive, and I think you're spot on, Paul. You have as well. Shaka can hit those longer passes from deeper in midfield. It's why I think he had such a good season last season, dropping into line of three. I think Sambi's a small space player, right? Little punch, a little pass, receive on the half turn, carry it one yard, give it off to the to the midfielder closest to him or the number ten dropping in. So I, I don't think this suited the way he plays either. Now, I, I, you know, look, I have said repeatedly that. When I do the Manscaped ads, I'm going to just say what I got to say. I'm not going to read their copy. They got a new Halloween promo going. And there's so much in this copy that, I, I mean, they went with like a full werewolf and vampire theme here. Some of this, I mean, right in the beginning, g g upgrade your grooming experience. Go from a bite-sized candy bar to a king-sized candy bar. I mean, that just sets the tone. Manscaped, go from a bite-sized candy bar to a king-sized candy bar. Now, I think that's overstating the benefit of, uh, of manscaping. I'll, I'll level with you. I think it's a wonderful thing to do. We all groom. We all should do it. But that, who? that is a big way to get started. There are 2 million, 2 million people worldwide who have used Manscaped, by the way. <clears throat> and with our promo code Arsenal Vision, you'll get 20% off free shipping. A couple other things. Have you ever tried to trim your balls and it turned into a Freddy Krueger film is one of the things they've gotten here? Um, there's another one. There's another really good one. Um, yeah, the, the ball toner will make your pumpkins stay fresh. If you're looking like Wolverine and haven't cut your nails, be sure to use the shears 2.0. I mean, I should just post the copy they send. Cause it is, I mean, it is rife with this kind of stuff. It's a full moon out and the werewolf in your pants is howling. It's time to tackle that problem with the lawnmower 4.0. Uh, ladies love their signature scent and it will scare away vampires. Not because presumably there's garlic in it. Because I don't, I don't think that would achieve the goals. <clears throat> yeah, th this is the kind of stuff. This is why I do my own stuff, by the way, because even I feel somewhat uncomfortable reading this stuff. But the good news about the plan they're running right now is with the performance package of 4.0, you're going to get the brand new um, uh, scent, 
uh, what, what do they call that? A body wash. That's it. Refined body wash, which is great. The body wash I use is terrible. So I'm glad they have one now. Can finally get a body wash. They're like, they got the body wash, the lawnmower 4.0. Look, the lawnmower 4.0 is the thing. And I'm I'm so excited to bring it to London on my travels, and everyone can can see that product firsthand if you don't have it already. But it has um it's it's wet, dry, skin safe technology <clears throat> with ceramic blades. Like it just does not nick or cut or scratch. It just doesn't. Um, and that's that's the best thing. Because like for me, I have tried grooming in the past, and all it takes is one nick or one cut down there, and you're like, why do I do this? I never want to do this again. So the skin safe technology is fantastic. Um, and, and the battery life goes on and on. And it's got a button lock, the weed whacker for nose ear hair, uh, that has become unfortunately a requirement for me. There's a shed, uh, shed bag, shed travel bag that comes with it. And the shears 2.0 for the nails. It's got it all literally t- totally groomed and ready to go. And then, you know, your pants werewolf or whatever. <laughs> Stop howling. So <laughs> go to manscaped.com, promo code Arsenal Vision, save 20% off of free shipping worldwide. Manscaped.com, promo code Arsenal Vision, free shipping, and 20% off worldwide. Clive, is that enough of that? More than, more is than. Your, is, is your pants werewolf howling? <laughs> Just please, please move on. Please, I'm I just you. I don't who writes this stuff. I mean, I, I know I can get to be a bit much at times, but my goodness. All right, uh, that that is indubitably enough of that. Well, I enjoyed look, what, that. You know, that was good. Did, yeah, it was good. Uh, Very and copywriters, the copywriters. Uh, I thought there was, was going to be some Ed, Edward Scissor hands in there, but he didn't show up. So no, I think that's because it's probably copyrighted, so they can't oh, okay. they can't use it. They could have just said like James Scissor Fingers or something. <laughs> James Scissorfingers. There you go. <laughs> that that Gunner blog should avoid that guy because he would definitely get hurt. Um, okay, so, Clive, um, l- let's praise something real quick because we've been a little bit critical. On days when your you're fun, sunny day players aren't getting it done and when you're not finding the exits on the counterattack and your your attackers who like you know to, to knee slide and celebrate aren't having the time of their life, those, those defenders who do all the ugly work have to come to the fore. I thought this was Tomiyasu's first really ropey game for us, and Tierney has been off kind of most of the season, unfortunately, and not a great game. Gabriel and White were brilliant, and White was brilliant in a way that I think we've been critical of him, headed everything away, was in position defensively. He marked his man touch tight for one of their near post crosses so that it couldn't be headed in for a goal. Gabriel cleaned up all, all the messes, put all the fires out, real leader at the back. Those two in the center of defense plus Ramsdale's one big moment that we talked about, kept this point. And I I think that it would be a shame, uh, while it's important to talk about the the failures of the attack to click and and to play out, it'd be a shame to let that overshadow the defenders who were the reason we kept a point. So you want to talk a little bit about how they were able to handle Brighton's threat and I I think really acquit themselves well on a day where very little else was working. Yeah, there's a there's a relationship going on between Ramsell and Tommy Asu White and Gabriel in particular. I think there's something soft factor ish, shall we say, that's happening there. And it it's just simple things. I was talking to my mate at work today, Mark, he's a goalkeeping coach, and we talk a lot about Ramsdale, not just his saves, but how he communicates to his defenders. Those parries, they are bouncing out to the edge of the area. They're not bouncing out in front so someone can tap it in. There is something to that. And simple thing like the other day when Kane took the shot and um, he was pushed out and Tommy Asi cleared it and there was that fist pump between them. But then there's a corner to defend. And so everybody's now pumped thinking, we're on a, we've got something going here. Eh? So it's not just what happens, it's the next thing that happens. And I feel with that sort of relationship has carried on into this game. And I think you can just see an improvement in all three of them. I, I, I do see them as a three. And you know why we know what they look like on paper. We can all describe their profiles. You know, we've all read the, the data. We've all seen the com- player profile analysis, mm. etc. But the, the word complementary is really key, and they are very complementary, righty and lefty. They defend in a similar way. Yet, well, how can I say? It? I think Ramsdale is a very is is a more of an extrovert, and he's extrovert in his character. Tommy Asu speaks to you, his energy and his movement. White is an extrovert on the ball, but he looks quite a quiet player, if you see what I mean. But on the ball, he's extrovert. He does quite some things there. And and Gabriel is the bombastic defender, like Tierney as well. Everything's big and strong and bang, collision, collision, collision. 
And I like that. If you compare what we had before, Leno's an introvert. He doesn't exude any energy, right? He drains, if anything, when he makes a mistake. You know, Pablo Marie, it's a straight face. It's, there's nothing nothing there. You've got to bring something to the show, not just your play, but what energy are you bringing to the team? Rob Holding's got a character to him. I think he's underestimated. Again, Callum Chambers, when he's not on it, he he shows vulnerability. He shows himself. He shows weakness. You can see it in his face. You know, the same for Bellingham, I'm afraid. We've got a set of players now that are really confident in their abilities. They're, they've got character and personality and bravery, right, as well as having good defensive attributes and the right priorities about how they approach the game. There's priorities on the can ball, priorities off the ball. Can I add on Ben White? Because I I think you did brilliantly, um, especially emphasizing the three plus, of course, this wasn't Tommy's best game. So you can on the ball though, Paul. It wasn't Tommy's best game, but he still did his job. You know what I mean? Cucurella had him a couple of times. It was the first time I've seen him. Kind of, there was one time, to be fair, where it looks like he got roasted, but I think he just lost his footing. You know the one I'm talking about? Yeah, he, and Cucurella sl- had the drop on him, and sometimes yep. that happens. That's just the way the the ball broke. Um, but my point was, uh, I was going to, was we, when you think of centre-backs who love to duel, you think of Gabriel. But something I've seen uh, over many games with Ben White is he absolutely fucking loves the duel in the same way Holding does, in the same way you see with Gabriel. He loves the battle, the duel. He may not love coming up against a six foot four uh, attacker or uh, opposing center back off a corner. Who does when you're six foot? He's, he's, he did really well in the air, but all those other duels, he, there's a reason he's a center back and not a midfielder. Fucking loves nicking the ball, beating the guy, being all over him. He absolutely loves the one-to-ones. And that's why he's a different, slightly different to Gabrielle, but they share that uh, absolute uh, pleasure from coming around the guy, taking the ball off and beating him, finding a way to, to win your battles. And Ben White loves that shit. It's just a different way he, he approaches it, Paul. So he yeah. he does it by being super sharp and intelligent, right? But he also, when people are concerned about him in the air, I, I went to the preseason game and I, and I watched him and, and I thought he won everything, like he did in this game. And he's all in the foot movement, reading the flight of the ball and moving your feet quickly to adjust where you are to win the ball. And he does that really well. Now, Ivan Tony, he, 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 he bos- boshed him. He boshed him on the day, right? But Ivan Tony's been boshing everybody. He is a flick on merchant. That's that's their game plan. Hit Tony and go from there. And he has beaten everyone. He stands off to side and he runs four or five feet and he jumps as a moving target and defenders normally coming onto it. It's a big collision going to happen there. So Ivan Tony needs he, he needs two men marking him. Someone to block his run off the side to slow him down so he doesn't get elevation. Again, he'll get scouted soon and that'll soon stop. You know, that will soon stop. At the moment he 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 sorted Ben White out. It doesn't mean that Ben White's crap in the air, we gotta do this, we gotta do that. Good player, mate. Nice feet, gonna get better. Really young. Body's still gotta develop. He is gonna be something. He really is. And yeah. we've got a signing there. I hope again, we, we, we have to stabilise him. We have to make sure people around him are not leaving him on an island because we've done that in the backs in the past. But I, I love the signs we've made around him. And hopefully they can stay fit and the worry is if they're not fit, what happens then? And then our judgment mm-hmm. then changes, right? Because we could expect him to do everything like we like we're expecting Thomas Party to do at the moment. But the opposition knows he's the only one there. So we're just going to look onto him. And that's our yeah. challenge going forward. Yeah, I, I want to get to the substitutions a little bit too. Paul, I thought that like, I I didn't disagree with them really. I just think mm. maybe they could have come a little sooner because it was it was clear some things weren't working. It wasn't Odegaard's day. It wasn't Aubameyang's day. I don't mind the subs that were made particularly. I I think the one that I'm, well, well let, let's take the ones that did happen before we take the ones that didn't happen. Um, in terms of Pepe, it, it, you know, he's he's a player that is so difficult for me to know what to make of because we did get him isolated in a couple of situations in the attacking third with a player to dribble. And I don't 
I don't know what it is, but Pepe can skip past a man when he's in the defensive third, when he's at the halfway line. They can't live with him. He gets in the final third, and he just, for whatever reason, cannot beat a man. And he he had a couple of good situations that went begging in this game because he couldn't get past his man. I'm curious what you think of, of Pepe's cameo because he did get into some threatening positions, and it was one of those days where he he could not make anything out of them. Um, I don't know what I think of Pepe's cameo. Um, he was once he came on, he was kind of involved in all of the good movements in, in terms of playing a role. So at least he was part of the connective tissue. Um, he came on on what something like sixty three minutes. So yeah, looking exactly at the t- sixty three minutes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So looking at the timing of the subs, it was Pepe at sixty three, maybe Lacquer for Abamyang on seventy one. I mean, that's not mm-hmm. terrible. I think especially because actually right up to that point, we had been the better team in the second half, I would say, or at least right up there. We'd had three, four good attacks. So I understand not hitting the kind of panic button too early with the subs, but we still weren't great. And the subs did make us a lot better. Um, I think a, a part of the benefit of the Pepe swap was <laughs> this sounds terrible. I love Odegaard, but it got Odegaard off, so Smith Rowe's role switched to the center. And he and, was good. Yep. And he was really yep. good. And he was yep. really good in the first half. Uh, he misplaced one pass the whole game, by the way. And on a night when there was a lot of sloppiness, and I think we passed at 74%, he was 24, 25, I think. Yeah, because we go to, well, what were the good things from this game? Well, the center backs. But I thought Smith Rowe was like in the final. moment in the box a couple of he puts in a great ball for uh, off the left with his left foot into a bamiang that their center back i think that's the first half uh gets his foot to just before a bamiang but it's a great cross with the left footer um and then there's obviously the moment in the second half when he's through to the box uh, but generally what happens once Odegaard is off is Smith Rowe drops a little deeper and starts getting involved and is more influential that, than Odegaard had managed to be. I mean, oh, uh, again, to Clive's point, it's the, the old hindsight thing. I wouldn't have expected that. I would have thought Odegaard could have dropped into midfield, picked up the ball, helped us play out in this game, but it just never happened. Smith Rowe, it was happening. So the more he and Saka... Um, and Lacazette in the second half dropped a little deeper, not all at the same time, but somebody drops, makes something happen. The other guy makes the third man run or off a wall pass, there's the third man run. That's when things started to really start to click in the second half. Um, Pepe, Pepe was definitely a part of it. I couldn't parse for you whether he was good, bad, or indifferent. I know what you mean on the dribbling, I, it, like his decision-making on when he decides to take a, on two guys instead just of just... doesn't ju- get past them. It's weird. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. But but he something happened in the second half, and, you know, and then they switched sides at one stage, Saka versus Pepe. Yep. Saka, Saka did Burns a few... Uh, is it Dan Byrne? Dan Burns. Dan um, Byrne. Mm-hmm. Yeah, two, three times in the first half, and that, that seems like where we should have had some real joy. I mean, just two, three great situations and did some other things dropping in. And him, Smith Rowe, for me, in the same way you can say, well, at least we had our center backs uh, standing tall. Uh, Might have seen, might have liked to see just a, a little more from Saka in terms of volume, not in terms of quality. There's that, he has a beautiful dribble in the first, I think it's five minutes maybe, uh, where he he minces Dan Burns and anybody else on the left side of the box and get, gets a fairly tame shot off, but it was a kind of indication of how Probably much our best he had. chance of the game. <laughs> yeah, um, those two guys were great, absolutely great. And then the Laka, Laka, Smith Rowe, and Saka. Anytime you get those guys anywhere near each other uh, with a little space, they're super dangerous and. That was the best part of the second half. And like Pepe was in the mix, so I I can't parse whether he was good, bad, or indifferent, but Mm. he was a factor. Well, so so then here's the thing, Clive, that I don't really understand. And I'm sure it's a tactical thing, because this is where I think coaching matters. You can't tell me that we don't have the better players than Brighton had on the pitch, especially with no Basuma, and especially in midfield. I mean, Smith, Rowe, and Saka can tuck in there. Odegaard's incredibly technical. Sambi and Party are good on the ball. We don't 
keep the ball in the final third. It is one thing we just don't do. Now, part of that is because we don't press and win it high up the pitch. So we don't start possessions higher up. And that's hard when they're pressing, right? So it, it's, it's you know, they're not starting possessions deep. Uh, they're starting possessions in your half. And we're kicking it long, giving it right back to him doesn't help. I'm just wondering if, does this, this system where we build up with three and then tuck one of the midfielders back into that left half space, does it mean that we don't get enough bodies into the opposition half to just control possession that part of the pitch? Is it because we don't push Tomiyasu up far enough, or is it because Sambi's starting possession's too deep? I I don't really connect <clears throat> with tactically why it's not happening, but I, I think, think... Yeah, sorry, sorry. I was just going to say, I think playing back to front is all well and good, and we've scored some nice goals you know, in the derby that way, but to be a really good team long-term in games like this, I think you need to have the ability to have you know three, four, five-minute periods of possession in the attacking third to push teams back, to keep them from being able to be that accordion where they stretch up the pitch against you. I don't know why we can't do that, because I feel like we should have the players who can. Yeah, well, every game's different. Right? So I think when I look at these games, I, I try to look for themes and principles. So things I'd like to see. So I, I, I don't mind seeing it's build up in a back three. Not bothered. Not bothered mm. at all. Tilly doesn't have to be in the fifth lane in the tank. He can be just slightly on the angle, right? Yeah. So, and maybe slightly inverted. Maybe you look at that a little bit more. And then I like to see a, a, a two there in, in midfield. That's, this is my, my preference, right? So, a, and a floating ten and, and, and three higher. That's what that's what I like to see. Um, so I'm okay with that principle that three build up because you, you normally got two strikers against you, so you've got superiority there, so you can build up. Brighton were very good. They gambled. They pushed people on. They pushed people on to our fullback. They didn't exit. Out, let us exit our fullback. The other fullback wasn't there. So Sambi was receiving the ball. We need to change that. We didn't change it quickly enough. So they locked on. So for me, yeah, the, the, well, you know what I walk away with from the day? Is that Brighton told, said to Arsenal Football Club, we're going to go man to man with Burn, Dunk, and Duffy. And we don't care about your front three because we think we can handle them. And so if you're looking for the development opportunity for his football club, that can't happen. So we've got to find a way of getting to the ball to those guys better or we have to have better players. Right? So mm. that that's that's a you know, that's <laughs> that's a bit of an insult to us, if you if you know what I mean. Mm. Um, I, I think it's an insult to us and I, I and I really do. And I think we need to play forwards that really made them think because Saka and Smith Rowe, they do like they gamble they'd come to the ball they gamble that a band gamble come to the ball and we did then we lost it yeah, yeah? and so yeah. They, the other team tells you about you you've heard me say it a hundred times right the other team tells you about you and so again look for the development when you're looking like I do on YouTube for new players <laughs> look for the the taller post-up player that can run like a million miles an hour and say, yeah, you want to go one-on-one -on -one with me? Well, let's go then. Let's go. You know, and and, and we didn't have that day. We had, two, we had two, we had two kids, mate, holding the team together on the outside who are midfielders, last pass merchants, and the center forwards didn't hold up the ball. And number 10, just like Andy Murray watching tennis, go over his head, mm. right? We're a very young team developing, developing roles, learning lessons, those same players the week before, the number two, the key that the two kids up front had a goal and assist each. Abraham Young was unbelievable. Odegaard, you couldn't touch him. Do you see what I mean? It's just a week later, the same players in a different scenario against a different system with the rain pinging their eyes, getting Odegaard smashed off the ball. Worked his arse off. Exactly. Pressing, running, all that kind of stuff. It just didn't it's, add up. This to didn't Hillary. work. It didn't work on the day. And yeah. it's, it's all right. It's all right. Man United drew 1 1 at home to Everton. It's all right. They spent a billion dollars on their team. It's all right. They got a, they got a guy there who's 36 and a half million pounds a week. It's okay. It, it's okay. As long and, as we and learn that's from fine. It. I think what it is for me, as I think about. This this team under Arteta and what it does well, like when it plays back to front quickly, you know, and at tempo and plays around pressure and gets it to those dynamic young players who can, you know, feed off each other and 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 really be direct and create fun scoring opportunities like we did against Spurs. That's great. The fact that we are a team that still continually does not have more than fifty percent of the ball, does not have 
stretches of possession in the attacking third. I think to be a really good team and win a lot of games in the league and pick up a lot of points, sure. Being able to play around pressure, play back to front is great, and you'll score some fun, some pretty goals that way. And being able to be solid at the back, which we are, is going to save you some points. But I think to pick up points a, a lot, you got to use the talent advantage you have against smaller teams and the technical superiority you have against smaller teams and hold the ball in the attacking third and put them on the back foot because it does two things. Not only can you start to create chances, and I know there'll be some people that say, we've seen that, and it becomes the horseshoe of death. Okay, fine. But when you are so, when your territory of possession is so defensive, so much in your own third and in your own half, you let these smaller teams push up, press you back, engage with you physically where the game becomes much more of a battle and much less about your talent and about your technical superiority. And I think we're seeing that happen too much. We do not, we do not have ha- over 50, 55% possession against these smaller teams. And we do not have s- can sustained periods of possession in the attacking third. That's not, by the way, I'm not saying that can't change and won't change, but I think that is something that needs to happen. And, and maybe one of the reasons we don't is we don't press. So we don't start possessions higher up the pitch we don't recover the ball in the attacking half with our players already there situated ready to start possessions we start possessions from goal kicks where we were five or 15 on the day from long kicks out from the goalkeeper where we were two of 20 on the day where the players that are trying to win win us possession up the pitch are tomiyasu not his strength tierney not so much his strength i would argue and so that that may have something to do with it. There is a player that I, I want I want to at least touch on in this conversation because I think it is a fair question about where where we go from a squad standpoint. Because Clive, you touched on you know the importance of the squad in, in the instant reaction pod. Paul a- Ainsley Maitland Niles came on in the 90th minute when when Saka went off with a, with an injury. Do we know if that injury is serious? By the way, and we keep him out of the England team or. Uh, just a cramp I mean, or anything like that? I haven't heard no. anything today, but uh, as of Hit. game day and the day after, uh, Arteta said uh, he wasn't worried about it. Yeah, I mean, the perfect know. solution scenario would be it keeps him from going away with England. Yeah, and, and then he plays for us against Palace. But I, I do think, look, in the 90th minute, it's hard to nitpick a sub. I, I think that there is a, a question about Gabriel Martinelli. Um, look, the goal is to win football matches. The goal is to pick up points. The goal is to get back into Europe. The goal is not to just have the player you like in the team get the minutes you want him to get. But this is setting up to be, I mean, it is a lost season for Balogun. That's fine. He's young enough and he's not really ready for senior football. He can play in the reserves, probably go out on loan in January. Fine. I don't know what Martinelli's future is because he's too good to play in the reserves. I, I don't think the team wants to put him there. They want him on the on the bench for the match, you know, match day team. But he's he's clearly not one of the first two subs, if not one of the first three subs, and that leaves him really on the outside looking in. Now, injuries and things like that can change it. But I'm wondering, Paul, if we're missing a trick in games like this where we're just struggling to break them down and we don't have the possession technically, and so someone like that who can run at defenders and be direct and just attack the penalty box, can he be someone in a game like this that that can change the dynamic? I mean, I know that we want to go for Pepe, and, and he's a player that we have a lot of a lot of um, money tied up in, and a very good player, a p- player that I like. But there's going to have to be a way to get minutes for Martinelli. A- and you know, again, to yes. be clear, the goal of Arsenal Football Club is not to get minutes for Gabriel Martinelli. But this is this is the the challenge that we have with the fixtures available to us this season is what is the squad and who are the players that are going to get minutes? And I feel like he's someone who should. So... Yeah. Do you see a missed opportunity to maybe get a player like him into this game? And if not, when does he get that window? Is it as simple as he's going to have to wait for there to be a knock that keeps one of those more established attackers out? Sure. Uh, look, I I don't think you look at this game and say, oh, but what does it mean for Martinelli? Um, he, was, he wasn't coming on. Maybe nobody was coming on unless Saka got a knock because we were going for it. And we had enough attacking get in behind. We'd made our choices, right? We had Pepe with Saka, we'd Smith Row, we'd Lacazette for a bit of hold up wall pass connectivity. Uh, we were we were very much in the game. Um, uh, I think you could argue for the way we were we were going to play, uh, I don't think Martinelli would have given us more possession. He would have given us more hit them on the counter and we had enough hit them on the counter. We just needed to do something with it. So uh, I don't think this is the game you assess it, and I can see why Martin, uh, sorry, Maitland Niles coming on made sense. Bit of control, 
he can help us get up the pitch. He's got some speed, but he also makes sure we don't after uh, on a day in which the manager and we all thought at a, a point was a reasonable result, result at the end of it. He didn't stop us counterattacking, but he helped us made, be a little more secure. So beyond that, where does Martinelli get his minutes? Um, it'll happen. Uh, we've we've just lost Chaka. Where was somebody going to get his minutes? We all thought he'd 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 play a significant role this season, but now we're on to where does Maitland Nile get his minutes? And he's only one uh, uh, one bullet away from being a starting midfielder. For God's sake, there's two three positions Martinelli can play for us. There's cup games. There's injuries. There's rotation. There's fatigue. Um, it doesn't mean I don't have, if I'm in the Martinelli camp, I don't have some level of concern. But is Martinelli good? I think we think he is. He'll get, he'll get played, he'll get used. I think we still carry this idea that, and I hear it all the time, that Arteta kind of has his favorites. And lots of people, lots of very, very reasonable people believe this to the point that I'm questioning myself. I don't think he has any bloody favorites. Well, first of all, you should. I mean, right, like, like it's just human. If you don't have your favorites, you're lying, right? Depend, there are, depends Arteta what definitely you mean by his favorite. favorites, though, right? <laughs> yeah, right. If it's a meritocracy of favorites, like mm-hmm. I don't think that's what people mean when they when they say favorites, though. They they mean uh, he's kind of got a skewed look at a player. It's not I, his I know type what you mean. of yeah, player. That, that I was sort of being, um, yeah, I was, I was sort it's of not really aimed at you. No, just to, to make the point that, like, first of all, I don't see saying that a, a coach has favorites is negative because every coach has favorites. Like, yeah. If you don't think that's the case, you're fooling yourself. You know. Yeah, there are players that suit the way you want to play more than other players, even if yes. they're equally talented. Uh, look, I think there's a big role for Martinelli this season, but you your moment will come, and then you need to take it, and then you'll get a run of games. And then the, what happens is the coach says, okay, this is working. I'm going to adjust how we set up for this player to get him in the team. Um, and the coach will, but he's not going to change the system for, to get Martinelli into the team when he has other players ahead of him. I mean, who do, who would we like to drop? Odegaard, Smith Rowe, Saka? No one. I, I'm not posing this question, by yeah. the way, to say that Arteta has gotten it wrong. I'm posing it because I'm genuinely curious if we can find a way for him to be sure. valuable this season because he has not played a minute in the Premier League since since think, that, um, that match against Chelsea. Yeah, I think in this game, you'd be thinking, okay, what's the future hold? Lacazette's the last year of his contract. Would we want to bring on Martin to that role? In, the, in that phase of the game, was 70th minute. Yep. Um, would we want to do that? That's what we're really saying. We're really the youngest team in the Premier League. Do we want to do that to, to Martelli and bring him in you know, away from home? You could do it for Saka. I thought he started to look a little knackered, a little tired. Yeah, now. that's fair. I think Saka is a, a, a late in games is a problem. I don't think he ends any game on fire. I think he struggles with uh, with stamina, as does Smith Rowe. Played Tierney. a very busy summer, if we're being yeah. fair. <laughs> yeah. And I'd like to see him sit down for a couple of weeks, but we know he's not going to. Yeah. Right, so I, th- I think the Martelli one's an interesting one because a bit of me thinks, you know, I thought, I'm sure I had him as my breakout player for the season. And I did that because I thought it was time for him to break out. I don't think I really believed it, you know. And sometimes players are, are memories for you. And I watched a game against Wimbledon the other day and I thought he looked incredibly energetic. A player that said, I want to show people. On a position, the pitch wasn't really for him. But I do worry about him a little bit. You know, I worry that he's not getting the development that he needs. And I can't see a route in at the moment. But as Paul alluded to, things change very quickly, really quickly. And there could be a game plan that suits him and he takes it and we go from there. It's just a hamstring pull away from playing significant minutes in the in the team, you know. Mm-hmm. So, just have to hold on, you know. Just have to hold on. At the moment, we're a covering football club. Last year was a development year for the for the team, for the coaches, for everybody to learn lessons. This year is about repositioning Arsenal properly, and are we going to need Marte to help us do that? It doesn't feel like enough minutes at the moment for a lot of players, but. 
while we were 10 points from the last 12, I don't care so much. When we've got some decisions to make around selection, which will happen when we have another rocky patch, then this conversation will come up again. Can I, can I ask one possible thing we could do, Clive? One thing that I've sort of been curious about to finish games that are mm. nil-nil or 1-1, one, one, if we want to go for three. And I'm not saying that that would have been the right thing in this game. I'm just saying generally, okay? So maybe it's a home game where, where we think we really need to push for three points. Given the way we use Tierney, as a a wide attacker more than a defender is a late, you know, is a 70 minute or 75th minute substitution that Arteta could look at bringing on someone like a Martinelli for a Tierney and, you know, letting, yeah, because you're already sort of doing that. And Tierney's already sort of spending most of his time, especially when we're trying to win a game supporting the attack. And it's not that Tierney's not a good attacker, but if it lets you get one more of a natural attacker who's got fresh legs on to attack those, you know, those tiring fullbacks and those half spaces as well, like, is, is that a solution? Because I think having Tierney run the touchline all game long, naturally what I think is going to happen is he's just going to start to sink back a little as the game wears yeah. on because he's not going to have the engine to keep going and making those buccaneering runs up the pitch. Yeah, I, we're, we're almost back to the where I made the point earlier about the five subs rule I, I i really do i really wish it was in playing football i think I, there are I, a few players who do too <laughs> I, I really do it's not i i really feel that this this is one sport where we expect massive coach influence but we don't allow him the substitutions enough to make those have that influence it's a sport that's massively dynamic and energetic and sprint based and movement based yet we only allow three substitutions. You generally keep one in your pocket for an injury. There's opportunities for young players that are being missed. Around Europe, there's, I think they're still doing the five subs around Europe, but I, I may be wrong, so someone will no doubt tell me. But I, I think it's an opportunity really being missed by the, the Premier League to help make it a far more tactical game. Because... Can, can you, uh, maybe you don't need five, maybe it's four over three three um, intervals. But I just think it will open up another side to the game hugely. And there's a lot of players around the Premier League not playing. And you could say, well, why are these clubs storing these players? Because of things that happened to Granit Xhaka last week. Out of nowhere, you lose someone for three months, right? That's why people have these you know, 25-man squads that, that are really two players each. But I, I do feel we're missing opportunities here. And the game could help. Not just the Martes as well, but there are many players around the league. I look at Callum Hudson Odoi, not getting enough minutes. Super talent, not getting enough minutes. There are many others around the league in the same situation. I, I do think it's it's a broader football discussion, but I, I think we're missing a trick. And Martelli would the one of the best arsenals I ever saw was drinks break five sub Arsenal in Arteta's reign. And I thought he was excellent during that period. He had the ability to change things. There are many other coaches who can do the same, and I think we're missing a chance as a as a football game overall. Yeah. I, well, then let me finish with this just about talent, Paul. This is a tricky one, and I don't, I don't want to spend more than a couple minutes on it, and I, I don't want it to be taken the wrong way, but I watched the City and, and Liverpool game, and Clive, you said this on, on Twitter, and I think this was you know spot on, is that you know a lot of people are going to want to use that game as a way to beat up our club you know, the quality of that game. There is absolutely no expectation that we should be where they are yet. City have money we don't. Liverpool are at the end of a cycle that's been very successful for them. We are just at the beginning of it. But when I watch what they do, Paul, I, we are so fixated on the manager, and understandably, and I don't think Arteta has done as good a job as I would have hoped when he first came, and there's still time for that to change, and he's still evolving. It's his first job, so fine. But there are moments. You know, football is... 10% moments that decide a game and 90% nothing happening, really, if you think about it. It might look pretty, the buildup might look nice. 90% of a football match, nothing happens. It's the 10% that it matters. And as I watched that game and the 10% for Liverpool and the 10% for City when it happened and when it mattered, the level of excellence on display from the players was sensational. And some of what Foden did in key moments or what Salah did in key moments, Salah, whatever... And I do want to ask you just, do we maybe have to sober up a bit about the talent level of our players? Not that they're not great, but that what you're seeing in that game isn't two teams that are just so much better coached than what Arteta's doing. That may be the case as well. They're two of the best coaches in the world. But that also in the moments that turn a game, 
What those players are doing is a cut above what our players are ready to do yet. Now, we have a young team, so they may get to that level. I don't think Mohamed Salah was doing that at that age. To be fair, Phil, Phil Foden is the age of any of our players. Um, do we need to sort of sober up about the talent gap, though? Because as much as I want Arteta to coach the team better and coach a better attack, the 10% of the games were, were the, the, that are moments, sometimes we're getting them right, like in the Spurs game, and you really feel good about it. And sometimes, like in this game, the execution just isn't there. And for those teams at the absolute pinnacle of the game, the way they can execute in those key moments is extraordinary. So how, how do you feel about that comparison, watching those games and seeing just the excellence of the individuals in key moments as it relates to you know, our, our need to just raise our level? Because we came away from what? From the Burnley game, from the Norwich game? Oh, nearly moments, nearly moments. Well, eventually, you get to a point where you say, the reason it's so many nearly moments is we're not executing and that that's something that i'm curious how you how you react to um how do i feel about it i feel the same way as you basically that was my reaction from watching the liverpool city game it's like holy shit like mm -hmm. uh, the second half when those both those teams were firing on the other hand it was also a game of moments especially on the liverpool side um city like they're just the level of play. Like they've got a worldy on the ball in every position. And what the yeah. fuck can you do about that? Joao Cancelo. I mean, fuck. He's, he is unbelievable. Yeah. 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 Um, but Liverpool, you know, they had James Milner on there doing, ha doing half a job really well and half a job, not at all. Um, you could go around their pitch and pick holes in their team but they've a fucking worldie on the right and uh, pretty close to that on the left and Diogo Jota. And uh, if you don't like him, they got Firmino. That's, you know, it's, they've, they can put out an awesome four, even with the out uh, TAA on the right. Um, in, in Fabinho, you know, top level, uh, but well, <laughs> I don't want to say anything here that, that's stupid because you shouldn't take anything away. Fabinho wasn't the reason they – might be the reason they weren't going to lose this game. Uh, he wasn't necessarily – he was part of the reason they were well in this game. Um, it, but he doesn't define how good they are. As a, I guess he enables it, so uh, I, I'll reverse myself that. Like he's a top-level player who enables how they play. But he's not the true string puller from deep, um, deciding the, the the patterns of play or whatever. Um, my point being, when I come to Arsenal, I don't know. I, I, there's a mismatch between how I feel, which is, holy fuck, that second half. No way we're playing either one of those teams any time in this season or next season and playing it's at that level. taking stuff, yeah. Yeah. And yet I go around our back four and I say... That's really fucking good. Our best hmm. back forward, back four when they get when they get going, really good. Thomas Party in midfield should be should be a worldy, is for half his games. Sambi Lakanga when he makes the full transition in a year or two, he'll have us right there. Granite Chaka half his game is top level, half there's a vulnerability, but and you know do we overcompensate fr from that? So that's definitely a minus. Odegaard, I don't know yet. I think he's top level out just around the edges of the box, but doesn't do anything to get in the box and do very much. And, and mm. so I'm still looking to see if that part of his game evolves. Smith Rowe, Saka, top level. Um, what we don't but like really trending have... towards top level, right? You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, sure. That's my point. We're yeah. sort of we're at that. We need them to get to that level. <laughs> can, can I just wrap up, yeah, Clive? Yeah. I, I can hear you chomping, but my, like, in the box, we don't have anything like Mane or uh, Mo Salah. Salah yeah. We just yeah. don't. And, and and City doesn't do it the same way. They, they've got people of brilliant talent in and around the box, but not abs the absolute finishers that just – they're kind of the ultimate, we'll walk it close enough to the goal and then you'll have Foden, who does get off a great shot. and you know. But they, they don't have an absolute finisher. I guess they were going after Harry Kane, but they don't have Harry Kane. Um, they're just brilliant across the pitch. But Liverpool have brilliant uh, finishers.
There was a video going around of Alexis Sanchez, a game Alexis, uh, the three nil against United where Alexis scored twice. I think and Ozil scored once. Yeah. And like Alexis was not a perfect player. No. But my goodness, he turned nothing into something. Brilliant finisher. And yeah. You have to have that. So Clive, th- that's the final thought I-, I take away from this, which is there's definitely a t- always a tension between it's the player's fault. It's the coach's fault. It's the player's uh, praise. It's the coach's praise. And there is a blending of those two. And there's certainly responsibility borne by both parties. If, we want to look somewhere other than the, the manager because honestly, looking at the manager after every game is just tedious as shit. Yeah, then absolutely. there is a need to look at another game like that and say, you know, I, I see us trying to execute some concepts that some of the other elite clubs are doing, but look at the players they're doing it with. I wonder what you think about what it would take for our talent level to look closer to, because that's where we want to go. I'm not saying we belong there yet, but we want to go there. Yeah. And and that that's not just a coaching thing. That's a talent thing too. Yeah, right. So <laughs> I think um, I, I, I absolutely love this game. I love the first half more than anything. The way City sort of overcame Liverpool. So Liverpool at Anfield, the, the pre, one of the pressiest teams after Brighton <laughs> in, the, in the Premier League. And what did City do? The way they controlled the ball at the back was unbelievable. Their exit strategies were amazing. Edison passing, long passing out. So when they crept on, he went over the top with like a bullet. His distribution was top on the day. And they literally took Liverpool's heart away. And Liverpool then stepped away and didn't engage. And then they built up, pushed the game forward, and then then pushed them back into their half. Liverpool are a territory team. They're a front-footed team that play in your half. They made them into a pussycat team that was sitting there watching people run all around them. They barely got to half-time in shape. They came out, I thought it was a smash and grab. I didn't think Liverpool were great. They got maximum reward for their effort because they got unbelievable two forwards, right? And they were both 29. And that's something I want to talk about because while we're eulogising over these teams, Liverpool team is starting to get old. So while we're watching them, we haven't seen them pushed around like that Anfield for for years while we're watching them and really appreciating their super talent in in Salah playing for his contract by the way we want £400,000 a week so he's running around looking great that that cycle will come to an end and there is more real Madrid or Barcelona to get them out of it right and their level of investment is going to be really interesting to watch Liverpool in the next year or so so don't think it's not attainable Man City are in a different place they can recover if they get Haaland it's all over we're just sitting there watching them Right, so they can do what they like because they're just bottomless pit. Liverpool are not. They're like us resource-wise. They're in a great cycle, and that cycle would be interesting to see how long it lasts for. Manchester United are dumb. We can get to these teams. Mm. We really can get to them. Don't think it's not attainable. We can get to those two. The other two that are that are resourced in a different way, it's a challenge, right? They've got to be thick to um, to, to mess it up, and they're not thick. Right, so... But Liverpool, Manchester United, okay, Manchester United are cash rich, and they they do they do stuff that can take us take them away from us. They do have some young developing players in Greenwood, Sancho, and and Rashford. If they develop as they should do, then it's it's over, right? So, but they also do dumb things. So we can get to them if we're smart and intelligent. So I don't look at this game and think, oh my god, we're so far away. No, I look at the game and enjoyed it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, was there solutions we can learn from? Goalkeeper distribution, definitely. Bravery to retain it, even amongst the highest pressure, definitely. Having quality in your third, definitely, to change the course of a game. But, wow, what a game. What a game. Man City, I walked away from that game thinking, you are a special football club. Three games in a week. Chelsea, PSG, Liverpool away. Unbelievable week. You know, mm. have we ability to play three games at that level, one after the other? We're not yet. We can't do that yet. But we can get one of these teams at home. We can get them. Yeah. One to watch, one to watch. Well, and, and, and I mean, it's funny because watching that game, I thought back to like when it was Arsenal and United and the way football has changed. Because Arsenal and United, for all the quality, they were wars. They were wars of attrition. And now you look at these games and they're so technical and they're so tactical and they are so fast. And it just, it's a, the game has changed. And I look at how the game has changed against Brighton because it used to be in the premier league when a team with superior talent 
like Arsenal showed up to play a weaker team with lesser talent. And let's be honest, Brighton didn't have a hell of a lot of talent on the pitch. Their best players are out. We had one of their best players from last season on our on our team. Um, you just swat them. They'd show up. They'd play 4-4-2. Their line would be high. Their lines wouldn't be compressed. You'd just play through balls at them for fun. It would be like what we did to West Brom in the League Cup. And now, coach, coach is like, so yeah, co- coach is level so high. You look at coach like Potter, and he can get them organized, and he can put them in a back three, and he can teach them how to press, and so you can't play around. And suddenly, the talent gap gets closed and and that is you know that is really what's interesting about football right now at the top level at the very top level it's Pep and Klopp doing the best coaching with the best players to produce the best football and it all has to work in synchronicity because the level is so high now so it's just a, a very high bar to to reach and um, you know I'm not saying we can't get there but we will uh, we will see I think we can leave it there we got a lot more to talk about this game and about the state of the club generally we have some interviews planned for the. Um, for the interlo, that's the word I'm looking for. We'll have a rewatch. Yeah, you're stuck with that. If you're a patron, you are stuck rewatching. If you're not a patron, you should sign up so you can rewatch that game. Come on, get in. Uh, and we will have our first European roundup with Phil Costa. So lots of good stuff to come. And really just happy to have you here. Thank you for everything. Thank you for the kind messages about the Lee Dixon interview. Uh, that's still up if you haven't listened to it. Uh, Lee was incredibly generous with his time and spoke brilliantly. And I thought it was very moving. So I, I hope you thought so as well. Paul's on Twitter. Pause my pants. Thanks, Paul. Woohoo. Clive's on Twitter. Clive PFC. Thanks, Clive. Thank you very much. My name is Alex Smith. about me on Twitter. Yankee Gunner. Um, no Arsenal for the next couple of weeks. I get to be there. I'm so excited. I can't tell you how excited I am to be there for the Palace game and, and hope to see so many of you there. So we love you. And we will talk to you after. My God, wouldn't it be fun? Arsenal 10, Palace nil. No.